Praise be to God. I welcome each and every individual who have joined today. All glory to our Almighty God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let them take care of you. So today, we are going to meditate upon a topic which is called Human Heart in the Book of Proverbs. Everybody knows we all have a human heart. And this heart has been given by the Lord. And our heart, what it does and what is happening in the heart, that is what we are going to see. Quickly, we are going to meditate this in three of the topics. And everybody can easily understand. So the key verse for today, it is from the book of Proverbs. Of course, we are going to see it from the book of Proverbs. About the heart, it has been said about many places. In Jeremiah, it says the heart is more, more or less deceitful. And many verses are there. But we are going to read it from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 5, and 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So the most important thing, what God is saying to our heart is, trust the Lord with all our heart. Wholeheartedly, you got to trust. Not on our own understanding. And we have to submit to him. And then he will make our paths straight. So let's go move on into the uh, book of Proverbs. We'll just uh, see the outline. And today's topic, we are going to see the human heart, which has got pride. The human heart, which has got anger, the human heart, which has got broken spirit. So these are the three topics we are going to meditate. First one is pride. Second one is anger. And the third one is broken spirit. If you want to easily make uh, understanding of this topic, you can have it PAB, P-A-B, pride, anger, and broken spirit. Okay, now we are going into the introduction to the book of Proverbs. Everybody knows the book of Proverbs. But when I was a kid, I was always being taught that Solomon wrote the Proverbs, Solomon wrote the Proverbs. But when you go deeply and meditate on the book of uh, Proverbs, it was Solomon who wrote many of the Proverbs chapters. And also it's mentioned in Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, 10, 10.1, 1, 25.1, 1, it is mentioned that uh, the Proverbs of Solomon. And uh, the wise men wrote uh, the book of Proverbs from Proverbs 22.17. To 2434, you can read that. And also Agur, he wrote Proverbs 30th chapter. The name Agur means gatherer or collector. Just for the information purpose, we're just sharing this. And last but not the least, Lemuel, King Lemuel, he wrote Proverbs 31. So if you wanted to know who wrote Proverbs, there are four of them who have done it. Wise men, many of the wise men. So it's not only four, it's four characters you can say. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay. The book of Proverbs. What is Proverbs? We say Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Psalms, many things we always uh, come across. But you got to understand what is Proverbs. The word Proverb in Hebrew is Michelle. The word Proverb in Hebrew is Michelle. Means to be like a comparison. You got to be like it's a comparison. Characteristics of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are very brief and concrete. They illustrate general truths and have diverse applications. See, the Proverbs are very brief and it's concretely saying to a statement. They illustrate general. It's a basic about, see, when you go through the general truth, uh, trust your Lord. You let, uh, trust your Lord, your God. Learn, uh, lean on, on to your understanding. Simple, simple, simple statements. And the application part, it has got a diverse application. Let's move to the next slide, please. Now, the main theme of Proverbs. What is the main theme of Proverbs? The book of Proverbs 4, 7 says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. So the main thing is get wisdom, get understanding. What is wisdom? What is understanding? We are going to see in the next slide. Yeah. Now we go to the... Purpose of the book of Proverbs. This is mentioned in Proverbs chapter 1, 1 to 6. If you read the, the book, you can understand that. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. What was the first purpose? Gaining wisdom and instruction. We've got to gain wisdom and also we've got to gain instruction. The second purpose, understanding words of insight. You've got to understand. First, gain the wisdom and the instructions, what has been taught. And then you got to have the understanding of the words. 
receiving instruction in prudent behavior. You got to be in the prudent aspect. Okay, there's giving some instructions. Okay, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it. You got to be that. Next. The fourth part, uh, doing what is right, just and fair, it goes with the prudent behavior. And the fourth purpose is giving prudence to those who are simple. Those who are simple, you are supposed to provide them prudence. And the fifth purpose is understanding proverbs and parables. The most important, last but not the least, you have to understand what the proverb says and the parables. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Now, many of us have a big doubt. What is wisdom? What is it going to do? What is understanding? What is knowledge? What are the differences? We are going to see that. Wisdom is the right use of one's knowledge, insight, and skill to the glory of God. See, the wisdom which we have has to glorify God. If it doesn't glorify God, it is not wisdom. It is a worldly wisdom. I'll explain to that in the other slides. It originates in the fear of the Lord. See, the most important thing, wisdom, starts with the fear of the Lord. Thus, Bible defines wisdom in terms of one's relationship with God rather than formal education or attainments before man. See, the relationship with God is wisdom. It's not about your formal education. Oh, I'm a wise person. I've learned so much. It's not that. Or your attainments in front of men. No, it's not that. Worldly wisdom is knowledge apart from divine revelation and often God opposing in nature. The worldly wisdom is always God opposing. It is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a part of from divine revelation. See, it's a part, but it's a, uh, always a God opposing in nature. Next slide, please. Okay. There are two kinds of wisdom. You might have read that. James 3, 13 to 18 says, James, who was the half-brother of Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, wrote this uh, book, Divine Wisdom and Worldly Wisdom. First, we'll see what is worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. Wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and self-ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So the worldly wisdom brings forth, which is of earl, earthly, it's unspiritual and it is demonic. So it always, uh, the wisdom will have pride and everything. We're going to see that. But if you see on the contrary, the divine wisdom, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. The wisdom from God is pure. Then it is peace loving. It is considerate. It is submissive. It is full of mercy and good fruit. It is in Impartial, it is sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So this is the divine wisdom. It is considerate, peace-loving, it is impartial, it is sincere. This is what God is saying. You can see this, how is a fool or who is a fool? We are going to see, because many of the times in the book of Proverbs, this terminology fool is mentioned. So before the, going into the three topics, we'll just go with a highlight of who is a fool and understand that. The fool is not one lacking in mental powers. He's not a one lacking in the mental powers. In scripture, the fool is the person who does not fear God. When you don't fear God, you are a fool and acts as if he could safely disregard the principle of God's righteousness. See, he acts against God and he doesn't want to fear God and he wants to disregard the principles of God's righteousness by just safely saying that, I don't know, I don't care. This is a fool's character. We're going to see that. Characteristics of a fool. He trusts in himself. Proverbs 12, 15, 28, 26, everything says. He trusts himself. When you have your trust on yourself, you are a fool. Deaf to instruction and despises the instruction anyone tries to give him. He's deaf to any instructions and despises the instruction anyone tries to give him then he's a fool. He cannot be disciplined. It is impossible to discipline this person. He's impulsive, he's rebellious, and he commits evil. He's virtually unchangeable. That's what the Proverbs verse says. Trust in himself, death to instructions, cannot be disciplined. He's impulsive, commits evil, virtually is unchangeable. That is a person who's called a fool. Now, we go into the three topics. The first topic is pride. The second topic is anger and the third topic is a broken spirit. 
That's what we are going to see what is in our heart. First topic is human heart, which has got pride. Let's move to the next topic, please. Okay. Pride goes before destruction. A hearty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction. Once pride comes into you, next it is going to be only destruction. That's what it is mentioned in Proverbs 16, 18. And you have companions of pride. Uh, we have a lot of companions, a lot of friends and companions. Pride also has a lot of companions. And we are going to see pride against God. Pride versus God. When you have pride, it is against God because our God, Lord God is a humble God. He is the example of humility. And then you are going to see what are the consequences of pride. That is what we are going to see in uh, today's topic. Now, the companions of pride. The first one is haughtiness. What is haughtiness? Proverbs 18, 12, 21, 4, 16, 18 says haughtiness is being disrespectfully proud. Oh my goodness sake. Haughtiness is disrespectfully proud. Holy macro. That is a big part of it. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty. But humility comes before honor. See, when you're humble, you get honor. When your heart is haughty, you go into downfall and destruction. And the next one is ridiculing and mocking, mocking someone. When we ridicule and mock, you know, we think that we are perfect. We are very nice. We are good. That is the time the proud and arrogant person, mocker is his name, behaves with insolent fury. He mocks. He makes a lot of words. Why? Thinking that he is so much great. He knows everything. He has everything. That is the reason you ridicule and mock against some person. The third is Boston. Proverbs 27, 1, 26, 17, 19 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Proverbs 27, 1 says, This I rarely experienced coming to the same to the Saudi Arabia in the year 1995. 1995. People who came from Kuwait stayed in the place called, uh, what is that, Al Koba. There, I, uh, in the year 90, I met a person. He was a luxurious person. He was a wealthy man. He had a lot of riches. But one day, when Saddam Hussein captured Kuwait, all had to leave their place. And he came. One day, the day before, he was the wealthiest person. But the day after, he was a beggar, begging for uh, the scopus we, we were just distributing. This is life. If you bo don't boast about tomorrow, you don't know what is going to tomorrow going to bring. That was a big eye opener for me. Do not boast because tomorrow you don't know. Today you are okay, but tomorrow. So be humble. Remove your pride from yourself. Now the second topic is pride versus God. See, obviously I say that pride is on one side and God is on the other side. So pride versus humility. That is the difference we are going to see today. Pride is sin against God. When you are proud, when you are not humble, you are sinning against God. Proverbs 3, 7 says, It is the assumption that man is self-sufficient and important enough to compete with God's greatness, magnitude, strength, and wisdom. See, this is where he is thinking he is self-sufficient. He can compete with God, but it is not possible. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. That is what uh, the scripture says. Don't be wise in your eyes. If God thinks, God thinks in a second, in a second, in a second, we are nothing. We are nothing. Because we came from the dust. We're going to go to the dust. If you think about that, you came from the dust and you're going to be in the dust, you'll never have pride. You will be humble always like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was a perfect example for humility. Pride opposes the wisdom and abomination to God. This is what pride does. It actually opposes. It opposes the wisdom and the abomination to God. See, that's the problem with pride. Uh, Proverbs 8, 13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. See, if you fear the Lord, you will hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. That is what King, uh, Solomon says. So pride is always against God. So when you are humble, you are with God. When you have pride, you are with the other person, the Satan. Satan is the perfect example of pride. Okay, now the consequences of pride. What happens? What happens when you have pride? We are going to see uh, three topics on that. 
The first thing is it brings forth to your life shame. It brings forth to your life shame. That is what pride brings. Pride seeks glory for itself, yet receives shame. Proverbs 11, 12 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. When you are humble, God gives you wisdom. When you are proud, you get disgrace, shamefulness on everything. We are going to see a subscriptural characteristic. Sticks who are proud and how God struck them. Strife or friction, it comes into your life. That is written in Proverbs 13, 10, 28, 25. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. See, what is wisdom? Listening to people, understanding what they are saying, and then giving the answer. But when you are strife, you have strife, or when you want to fight against somebody, then uh, when you have uh, proud characteristics, you will not listen. You will not take it to your heart because you are thinking you are above everybody. But actually, when God thinks in a moment or in a second is enough for him, for the destruction which you are going to read. Proverbs 15, 25, 16, 18 to 19, and 18, 12 says, Pride goes before destruction. The pride is equal to discretion and haughty spirit before a fall. This is what happens. When you are proud, you are destructed. When you are humble, you are lifted high. You are lifted from the dust. You are lifted to be seated against, as seated with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is on the right hand of the Father God, interceding for you and me. Our best example is King Uzziah. He was a very good king, believe me or not. Second Chronicles 26, 16 to 21 says, he was a very good king. He was a very powerful king. He was also a God-fearing king. But what happened in his life? What happened? We'll just read that uh, few passages, then we'll understand. But after Usia become powerful, his pride led to his downfall. That is the problem. When you feel that you are powerful, immediately what comes into you? It comes pride into you, hearty spirit comes into you, strife comes into you, and later on it turns into destruction. What is the simple thing? Only the priests are supposed to take and burn incense in the uh, temple of God. What did this guy do? I'll just read a few passages and then you can understand. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense. He's not supposed to burn incense. The priest's job is to burn incense and he's not supposed to do it. Azariah, the priest with eighty other uh, courageous priests of the Lord followed him. They confronted King Uzziah and said, it is not right for you. Uzziah, the king, you are not supposed to burn the incense of the Lord. This is for the priest. God has allocated the priest to burn the incense. The descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense, leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and you will not be honored by the Lord. But what did Uzziah do? By the, by the statement they said, he should have returned back. He would have been humble, he would have gone back. Now he's thinking he's powerful. God is with him. He can do anything and he can bring disgrace in his uh, proud characteristics. You see how we had incense in the heart, ready to burn, become angry. Now what happens? Anger comes. Oh, who are you to tell me? I'm so mighty, I'm powerful, I'm aware of everything. While he was raging at the priest in the presence before the incense the altar, leprosy broke out. See, the moment he took the incense and everything, leprosy broke out in his forehead. Oh my goodness. He's not supposed to burn the worst verse I'm I'm reading. King Uziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the play palace and governed the people. See, he was distracted one moment. With anger, he just broke away from the Lord. He came away from the Lord. And because of proud character, he became a leper and he died. And he never entered the temple of the Lord. The second topic is the human, the, the human heart has anger. First one we have finished, the human heart. According to the book of Proverbs, it is mentioning that it has got pride. The next one is anger. Better to get angry slowly than to be a hero. Better to be even tempered than to capture a city. See, this is the best part. Better to get angry slowly, but our blood clot. We get the veins protruded. So much of anger comes into you. So three topics we are going to see. Anger, reaction to anger, handling anger properly. Yes. Next slide, please. Now, what is anger? 
not always bad. Anger is not actually always bad. Why? Feeling angry is not wrong. But responding to anger as silly and irresponsibly is wrong. See, you get angry and then you just cool down. In our life, sometimes you get so much anger and then we just slowly cool down. And you say, okay, I'm fine now. The man slow to anger is praised in contrast with the quick-tempered man who improperly expresses his anger. See, that is the problem. There is a first part, slow to anger, and the other part is quick-tempered. You got to be a slow to, slow to anger person. When anger comes into you, what all comes from our mouth? I'm practically speaking from my life, I'm telling you. Immediately when you get angry, the words which come, or sometimes you wanted to break somebody, God is saying, be slow to anger. Be yeah, a quick-tempered person. He is the person whom I'm just uh, reflecting. Don't get quickly tempered. Just relax. Okay, whatever is said, whatever. Maybe, maybe what has happened to you may be wrong. Maybe somebody has done wrong to you. But still, God is saying to become angry, you have to be slow. What Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 says, be angry without sinning. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the eagle any, I'm sorry, devil, any opportunity to work. This is one of the translations. In one or other translation of, um, I guess it is uh, King James Version or NIV, I don't know. In your anger, do not sin. That is the beautiful statement. What happens? In your anger, do not sin. To become angry, don't do any sin. That is what it is mentioning. Everybody gets anger, but be as just try to uh, talk some verses or say, that's what I try to do, but still I'm failing at many moments. But God has to give me the real uh, slow to anger characteristics. Reaction to anger. How do you react? That's what we were discussing previously. Ecclesiastes 7.9 says, not control over the spirit. Do not be quickly provoked in your smile. Where are you provoked in the spirit? For anger resides in the lap of the fools. So another fact, the scripture says, Ecclesiastes 7.9 says, when you become, a, become angry and you react, then you are a fool. Because the anger which commits sin is a fool's characteristics. On the other hand, if you are a wise man, if you are having wisdom, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. Just control over it. Slow to anger. There are two types of persons. Only two types. One is quickly tempered or quickly angered. The other person is slow to anger. Control over the spirit. When you have control over the spirit, that's what I said, you know, in your anger, do not sin. This is the correct uh, translation which always we see. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a uh, foothold. See, what happens is when you be become anger, and you control it, nothing happens. When you become anger and you kill somebody, or when you become anger and hit somebody, or when you become anger, ang when you become angry and you just spit out the words, it cannot be taken back. So be slow to anger. It's a big lesson for me. I'm preaching to you, I'm telling you, but still, God has to give each and every individual and myself a uh, person uh, to be slow to anger. You are quick tempered not having the control over the spirit. So what happens is Proverbs 25, 28 is mentioning, what comes, you'll start to speak foolish words and then you stir up fighting. First, you start with foolish words, all the blabbering and blasting words come out of our mouth. Then you stir up fighting. Then you hurt themselves, means ourselves will be hurt. Sometimes you go for a fight, we get hurt. We become sick, tense, miserable and self-pity and other cases you hurt others what are the things we do we speak foolish words we go into fighting hurt ourselves and hurt others bitter and unforgiving, unforgiving characteristics comes into a quick tempered man speak foolish words proverbs 29 20 says have you met a person who is quick to answer there is more hope for a fool than him see if you answer slowly, then you are a wise person. Immediately you answer. So what happens is a fool immediately spits out whatever comes, foolish words. Stirring up fights. A hot head stirs up a fight. 
But one who holds his temper calms dispute. A person who wants to fight off and meet is with full of anger. He immediately stirs up the fight. But the one who holds his temper, who controls his spirit, calms all the disputes. Proverbs 15, 18 says that. Next slide, please. Okay. Hurts themselves. They become sick, tense, miserable, and a, a great self-pity person. A person's spirit can endure sickness, but who can bear a broken heart? Proverbs 18, 14 says, see, it's based on your spirit. When your spirit is triggered, when your spirit is irritated, immediately all these things happen. You become a sick person. You become tensed. You are a miserable and self-pity person. Hurt others. How? You are bitter with others, unforgiving. I am saying that characteristics without hitting or anything. You, you are bitter, hurting others. Get rid of all your bitterness. Ephesians 4, 31 to 32 says, Hot tempers, anger, loud quarreling, cursing, and hatred. Be kind to each other. Sympathetic, forgiving each other. As God has forgiven you through Christ. That's what he's saying. Remove bitterness, hot tempers. Anger, loud quarreling, curse and hatred. Be kind. When kindness, love comes to you, you're empathetic, forgiving each other as Christ Jesus has forgiven us all to the, uh, the Father. Slow to anger. What is slow to anger? Controlling over the spirit. What is controlling over the spirit? How to control over the spirit? This is more important. You have to say, I, how I have got to be slow to anger? From tomorrow, just think. By understanding. What is understanding? Proverbs 14, 29 says, a person of great understanding is patient. Understanding is you must listen first of all. You must give ear to somebody is speaking because I have a big uh, worst character of just intimacy, I mean, intercepting people and talking to them. Always my wife used to say that let the person who is uh, with you or the person who is talking to you, let them finish. Why you are immediately intervening? Why you are immediately moving into their dialogues? But a short temper is the height of stupidity. So understanding, it is patient. A person of great understanding will be a patient person. Patient means he's got a lot of patience. He's got a lot of humility. Next is by discerning. Discernment is the spirit. You got to ask our spirit of the Lord. A person with good sense is patient. And it is to his credit that he overlooks an offense. See, a person with good sense is patient quietly. And to his, see, he is not going to do any offense because he has the control over the spirit. When you control over the spirit, you're not going to go into any offense. You're not going to hurt anybody. You're just going to control yourself. And also you will just do it by discerning. Proverbs 19.11 says, next slide, please. Handling anger properly. How you will handle anger? Everybody asks this question. Oh, how you can handle anger? Break the pattern of getting angry for even small things. What happens is any petty, petty things, small, small things, you become very angry. Remove it. Okay, it has happened. What else to do? What's next? Go by it. Guard your mouth, especially for me. You got to guard your mouth. Get rid of anger and don't allow it to build grudge. Next comes grudge. Anger causes a lot of grudge. Redirect your anger to the problem and not the person. Go to the problem and not the person. The person is utilized by the Satan or the devil. So forget about it. What is the problem? Try to find a resolution for the problem. So, and the most important thing is respond gently. You got to respond to it very gently, calmly, coolly, patiently. That's how you will be handling that. What is break the pattern of getting angry for even small things? Proverbs 19.19 19 says, a person who has a hot temper will pay for it. If you rescue him, you will have to do it over and over. See, that means you have to control your uh, temper. You have to remove your hot temper. You got to be a cool person, calm person. Once you rescue a person of hot temper, what you will think every time you will have to go and rescue him. So what you have to do is, even for small things, small, small things, you're not supposed to get angry. You got to control yourself. That is the most important thing. Now, guard your mouth. How you can guard your mouth? Whoever has knowledge controls his words. And a person who has understanding is even-tempered. See, whoever has knowledge controls his words. When you go 
uncontrollable with your words, then you are a fool person. When you have the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, you will control the words. And a person who has understanding is even-tempered, means whatever comes, he has understanding, yes, this has happened. It's not him, it is the Satan. So he will immediately come to conclusions. Now, even a stubborn fool is thought to be wise if he keeps silent. See, a stubborn fool is thought to be wise if he keeps silent. When he's silent, he's not doing anything. Then we say that, oh, he's a great guy because he's quiet. He's considered intelligent if he keeps his lips sealed. A fool also become a great person, a wise person, because he keeps his mouth shut. Though you have wisdom and knowledge from the Lord and understanding from the Lord, if you open your mouth and your lips speak, that's what it says, Proverbs 17, 27 and 28. So guard your mouth uh, and your lips. Next, get rid of anger and don't allow it to build grudge. What happens is anger slowly, slowly, slowly builds and a lot of grudge comes. Philippians 4, 26, 27 says, remove it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Redirect your anger to the problem and not the person. Focus to the problem. What is the problem? How I can remove, how I can resolve it. That's what Philippians 4.29 says. Don't say anything that would hurt another person. Instead, speak only what is good so that you can give help wherever it is needed. That way, what you say will help others or those who hear you. Others or those who are hearing you. It should help and not it should uh, violate them or not should trigger them with your words. Direct your anger to the problem, not the person. Respond gently. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle answer turns away rage, but a harsh word stirs up anger. When somebody comes and gives you a harsh word, you also give a harsh word, then it stirs up big anger. A lot of fighting starts, but a gentle answer. Okay, colors. Good. Somebody says you are a fool, say yes, I'm a fool. Colors. No issue. You shouldn't retract or retaliate and say that you are a fool, your family is a fool, your father is a fool. Then all problem starts. Now, examples of anger. The best example before we go into Cain slaying Abel, I would like to say about Moses. Moses, he was supposed to guide the whole Israelites into Canaan. That was the target given to him. That was God called him. He was the greatest person. He was the humble person, a meek person on earth. But in one occasion, he lost his temper. He hit the rock when God, wanted, uh, God told him to speak unto the rock. He hit it and ultimately he raged in anger. He said, how long I've got to be with this generation? And ultimately, what was the answer from the Lord and what was the punishment for him? He couldn't enter the land of Canaan. Everybody entered of his age, but Moses couldn't enter. It is the same for us. In anger, if we sin, we will be missing out the eternal Canaan, heaven. So in your anger, do not sing. Now let's go into the examples. Instead of Cain slaying Abel, we know this characteristics very well. Genesis 4, 5 to 8. Now, Cain is angry because Abel's offering was taken by the Lord, accepted by the Lord. Now then the Lord asked Cain, why are you angry? Why do you look disappointed? Now he's saying, but if you don't well, sin is lying outside your door. See, sin is lying. When you're angry, sin is lying at the door. If it wants to control you, but you must master it. Cain talked to his brother Abel. Later, when they were in the fields, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. See, this is what happens. He was angry because his, uh, what is the offering was not accepted by the Lord. The Lord accepts what he likes. Okay. In the scripture, it is not mentioned why God accepted and why God rejected uh, Cain. But God accepted Abel. So you'll have to go by it. Yes, my brother's offering has been accepted. You live by it. Instead, what happens? It started anger, grudge. It was to the top, haughtiness, pride. Everything came. And ultimately, Cain killed Abel. Abel was the first martyr in the scriptures. The next example is Saul towards Jonathan, his own son, his own son, his own blood, an account of his sympathy with David, because David and Jonathan were the best, best friends. If you got to read the scriptures, you cannot see a friendship like David and Jonathan. Now, what happened? I, he's saying, the father is saying to Jonathan, I know you have sided with Jesse's son. Who is Jesse's son? David. You have no shame. You act as if you are your mother's son, but not mine. So the mother also liked David, I guess. Now, what happens is, Jonathan asked 
asked his father, why should he be killed? He's asking why my friend David has to be killed. What has he done? Saul raised his spear to strike him. Then Jonathan knew his father was determined to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table, very angry, ate nothing that second day of the month. He was worried, sick about David because Jonathan had been humiliated by his own father. See, David is now so much uh, uh, thinking and he's very much sick because Jonathan is humiliated by the father against the son because of David. Because he's saying that, Jonathan, you are supposed to become the king. But Jonathan is saying, no, the Lord has already anointed David as the king. He has to become the king. He says, no, we have to kill David and you have to become the king. When he says, when he's siding out with David, he's very angry. Of course, with the David also, Saul, oh my God, wherever uh, David went, Saul chased. Wherever, uh, I mean, um, he could kill uh, David, he was running after him. Ultimately, David never touched anointed man of the Lord. He died by himself. So anger brings forth death also. Next. Yeah. Next comes Ahab, King Ahab. Because Naboth would not sell his vineyard. Now, Ahab did the biggest mistake of marrying Jezebel. Okay. She is the worst lady in the scriptures. Okay. She was behind the idols and everything. Idol legend. Everything she was doing. But Ahab now is uh, when he is uh, not happy. He is very much upset because, see, he is the king. He has everything. But just next door, there is a vineyard of Naboth, a poor, poor fellow who has got a vineyard. He wants that vineyard. This is what happens in the world now also. You have everything, but a small guy having a small thing, you wanted to take it. You want to inherit it. It is the inheritance of his forefathers. Now he is very angry. He is not eating. He is not doing anything. Ultimately, this lady Jezebel tricked and she killed Naboth. And with pride, she was running around and uh, dogs licked uh, Jezebel's uh, uh, blood. That's what was the punishment. See, now she is uh, promising. I will give you the vineyard belonging to Naboth. She gave. Ultimately, you know, anger brings death. That's the worst part. The people of Nazareth towards Jesus. There were so many people with skin diseases in Israel in the prophet Elijah's time. But God cured no one except Naaman from Syria. What he's saying, many of them were there, but during the period of a prophet Elijah, Naaman, who was a Gentile, was cured by God. Everyone in the synagogue became furious when they heard this, because what is this? Salvation is only to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. That's what is their feeling. But God is saying, salvation came first to the Gentiles, not to you people, you stiff-necked people. Their city was built on the hill. Kit. They, intend, they also wanted to intend to throw him and kill him. But Jesus walked right by them and went away. That's what Jesus did. They are angry. How he retaliated, a humble a man of humility. How did he retaliate? Their anger. They're in anger, but he told whatever he's supposed to say. Gentiles got the salvation, but when they wanted to kill him, he slowly moved away, did not intense any rage or anger against them. Next slide, please. Jews against Stephen. My goodness sake. This you can read in the book of Acts. As the council members listened to Stephen, Stephen, he completely told the Bible. Right from the creation, Abraham, everything. Such a beautiful, notorious person. He was just go to the scriptures. Now, Stephen was full of Holy Spirit. He looked into heaven, saw God's glory, and Jesus in the haunted position. Where is Jesus? He's seated at the, the right hand of the Father God, the one next to the Godfather of the heavenly throne. So Stephen said, look, I see the heaven open, and the Son of Man in the haunted position. Now, everybody's throwing stones. One of the person who was there also was Saul who later became Paul. He was, in fact, uh, there on the first martyr of the um, uh, New Testament. Stephen, he was there. They were all so much with anger. Why? Stephen said that Jesus is God. They never accepted Jesus. Third part is the human heart. It is the broken heart. It's a broken spirit. It's a broken spirit. First one we finish, the human heart has got pride. I told you, Pab, P-A-B. Today, tomorrow, when somebody is going to ask you what was the topics you discussed, you easy, easily you can see Pab, P-A-B. Pride got in the heart, anger I got in the heart, a broken spirit. Let's go into the broken spirit. Let us go and see what is there in the broken spirit. Next slide, please. We're going into the last topic. Yeah. 
A happy heart makes the fight cheerful, but heart attack crushes the spirit. See, that is what a happy heart makes the, her face cry. That's what it is mentioned. We are going to see that in three topics: a broken spirit. What can what what can break one's heart? What what is it can break one's heart? Putting the pieces back together again. Three topics: broken heart. What can break one's spirit? And putting back the pieces once again. A broken spirit. What is a broken spirit? How a spirit breaks? We are going to see. How is it going to be broken? How it breaks? People can become exhausted and give up. Sometimes you become so much exhausted. At work you are exhausted. Maybe at school you are exhausted. Or maybe at the house cooking and working you are exhausted. The heart is overloaded with sorrow and the spirit will desire. And inner strength is broken. When your inner strength is broken, that is where you have a broken spirit. It's not as, it is. it could be seen outside or it is very much inside. Many people today are living with that broken spirit. Those people cannot help themselves. In that piece, these people cannot help because they're broken, totally broken. They try, they're downtrodden. Others cannot help them because they're not selling to others. They're not speaking out to others. A person's spirit can endure sickness. But who can bear a broken spirit? Proverbs 18, 14 says, who can bear it? Who can bear this broken spirit? That's what God says. Difficult to share it. Why? Why? Because a man's inward feelings are known only to himself and God. And sometimes they hide those feelings also. They don't show it. You and I, everybody, we have a broken heart. We don't show it outside. We hide it. We wanted to keep it. The heart knows its own bitterness. And no stranger can share its joy. Proverbs 14, 10 says. That's what happens. Difficult to cheer up. You cannot cheer up. When you have a broken heart, everything is broken to pieces. It's very difficult. Attempts to help them often makes things worse. It makes worse because they are not prepared to build, put the pieces back and to get back. Difficult to share and difficult to cheer up. Next slide, please. What can break one spirit? How is this possible? How is it possible to be broken? First thing comes fear. Correct. A person's fear sets a trap for him. But one who trusts the Lord is safe. Proverbs 29, 25 says, you fear for everything. Everything you fear. You, you have a fear of a lot of things. When you have fear, when you have fear, when you don't have faith in God, then the fear, fear comes. When you don't have the trust in the Lord and you see that the Lord is on your side, you have fear. You have to remove that fear. Next comes anxiety. Proverbs 12, 25 says, a person's anxiety will weigh him down. It will weigh him totally down. But an encouraging word makes him joyful. Anxiety puts you down. It puts you down. Fear has set a trap. Anxiety has made you down. And last but not the least, depression. Travels 15, 15, there was a survey in the whole world. How much people are undergoing through this depression? A survey says most of the people, most of the people are down with depression. Every day is a terrible day for a miserable person, but a cheerful heart has continual feast. Let your heart be cheerful. All your brokenness be put into pieces. God is telling you, our Lord is telling you, fear. Fear keeps our confidence and enthusiasm. Our own fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of inadequacy becomes stronger than our fear of God. When you have fear of God, fear against all these will run away. Do not be afraid of a sudden fear. Okay, if you have fear of the Lord, definitely the worldly fear will never come to you because you are strong in the Lord. Because God is saying, oh, my son, my daughter, he's a fearful person against me. He's a godly person. How can I let him down? Or the destruction of wicked people, when it comes, you are fearing for the wicked people. Guilt conscience sometimes causes fear. Yes, when you are guilty, you did something. When you are guilty, immediately causes fear. Wicked person, please. When no one is chasing him, but righteous people are as bold as lions. See, when you're righteous, you're like a lion. Because why? You are bold. Because fear is not that. You're not a wicked person. You're a righteous person. And the wickedness is opposite to the righteous. It can result in great emotional distress, paranomia, and produce one's fantasy world. Once you have this fear, you go into a fantasy world, thinking that this is going to happen. That is going to happen. Nothing has happened. God is telling you it is not going to happen. But still you see that you are going to fight this. Next slide, please. Anxiety. Constant fretfulness produces a depressing anxiety that totally consumes the will, desire, and inner strength. 
what happens? See, constant fretfulness produces a depressing spirit. Oh, I am alone. For example, my, my condition is the same. If I'm going to be a depressed person, oh, I'm alone. I just met my family two years ago. They are in Abu Dhabi. I couldn't go. How I'm going to go be? I'm, how, how I'm going to live alone? All these things, when you think more and more and don't have the faith in God, if you're not focused in God, if you don't have the fear in God, faith and fear in God will remove the fear of the world and all your unfaithfulness, everything will be removed. Let go of anger and leave rage behind. Do not be preoccupied. It only leads to evil. What is that? You are preoccupying the mind with something stupid, sluggish. Instead, preoccupy your mind with the word of God, prayer, meditation, and thinking about God, goodness, kindness, love. Then everything will be okay. Worries and troubles waits up, down, until they break that person. See, until he is broken, everything dies. First Peter 5, 7 says, turn all your anxiety over to God because he cares for you. That's what he says. Cast your burden unto the Lord. I will take care of you. That's what he says. But what we do, instead we carry all the burdens with us and go to God. Lord, Lord, my burden is big. God is simply giving you a statement. Cast your burden to me. I'll take care of it. But you don't want to throw it. You want to carry it. Because we have been carrying it. We love carrying it. But God is today telling you, if you have your burdens, cast it unto the Lord. Depression. Depression is the downward spiral that causes a person to break his own spirit. And this condition worsens by neglecting responsibilities, resentment, and safety. See, this is where you get depressed. When you get depressed, this is what happens. What happens when you get depressed? Your condition is worsened. You are neglecting your responsibilities, resentment, and you wanted to face self-pity. This is what happens. A joyful heart, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but with a heart attack comes depression. Proverbs 15, 13 says, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but with a heart attack. Putting pieces back together again, how you can put it back? Oh, you are broken. You have depression. You have anxiety. Now you got to put it back. How you will put it back? How? It says, by trusting in God. Proverbs 16.3 says, trust in the Lord. By seeking not the worldly wisdom, but the wisdom from heaven, which is pure. That wisdom you got to seek. Proverbs 3.21-26. to By having hope, faith, and love. These three, you have it. It's difficult, but... What I'm preaching, I wanted to follow. You also try to follow it. Uh, God will give you, remove all the fear from you, all the anxiety from you, the depression from you by talking and listening to friends. This is more important. You've got to talk to your friends. You've got to listen to your friends and understand. Then all these will be put back. Trusting in God. How you'll trust in God? Entrust your efforts to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Exactly. Entrust it to him. Okay, Lord. Let come what may. Let it happen. Proverbs 16.3 says, A person's fear sets a trap for him, but one who trusts the Lord is safe. See, your fear is making a trap to you yourself, but you trust in the Lord, you are a safe person. Proverbs 29.25 Whoever trusts in his own heart is a fool. I, your heart. I'll be strong. I can do this. I can do that. You're a fool. Whoever walks in wisdom will survive. The wisdom of the Lord. What is wisdom? Fear of the Lord is wisdom. When you walk in the fear of the Lord, you will survive. Proverbs 28, 26. By seeking wisdom, Proverbs 3, 25 to 26. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or the destruction of wicked people. When it comes, the Lord will be your confidence. He will keep your foot from getting caught. This is why when you seek the wisdom, the Lord will take care of it. Of course, you will go through a lot of uh, pain, tribulations, suffering. It's not that a Christian life is better for roses. It's a bed of thorns. You got to walk through it. Then only you can attain eternity by having hope. Proverbs 13, 12. Delayed hope makes one sick at heart, but a fulfilled longing is a tree of life. You got to have the tree of life. That is what, when you hope in the Lord, you will have it. By talking and listening to friends, Proverbs 27, 9. Perfume and incense make the heart glad, but the sweetness of a friend is a fragrant forest. That's what is beautifully compared by the author. The sweetness of a friend is a fragrant forest. For when he comes, when he talks to you, you are he's giving you a fragrant the example. Let's see the example. Who is the example? As they were Martha, oh my goodness sake, there were two sisters. 
Okay, one is Martha and the other one is Mary. What did Mary do? When uh, Jesus went to their house, there were three, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Okay, Lazarus, the brother. That is the one who Jesus brought back to life after four days. This is where the incident happens. Now, Mary, Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him. And she was not disturbed. She was just listening to him. But Martha, who was taking care, oh, I have to cook food. I have to do that. I have to do this. She's worried. <laughs> She is in anxiety. She is so much stressed out. Martha, Martha, Jesus said, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. There is only one thing you need. Mary has made the right choice. And one thing will not be taken away from her. See, she has taken the good part. Of course, somebody has to do the work. She has taken that work. You have to do it. Because uh, Lord Jesus Christ has come. You wanted to cook. You wanted to make food. Of course, we have to live. But what food is more important? We, me, everybody run around the food of the world. But we wanted to have the real food, the manna, the word of the Lord, which comes out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is where we have to have the choice. She had a lot of stress. She had a lot of anxiety. She had a lot of depression. And she was running around like a mad woman because she was running around the worldly food. But uh, Mary, she was waiting for the manna from the Lord. That is what you and I are supposed to do. Next slide, please. Now, we have seen all the three topics. One is pride. Bam. Anybody, if we are going to see tomorrow or uh, any time, what was that in our heart from the book of Proverbs? You got to say, Bam. pride, anger, a broken spirit. But God is today saying, as a believer of God, as a child of God, as children of God, what you must have, you and I should have, what? That is what we are going to see. Uh, believers must have. Love God with your whole heart. Full heart. Love the Lord your God. Next one. Sanctify God in your heart. A believer's heart. Sanctify, uh, serve God with all your heart. Not like small. Like uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira. They served God. A little bit portion they kept. Not like that. Serve God with all your heart. Walk before God. With all your heart. Trust God with all your heart. When you trust God, trust God 100%. 100%. Whatever he has told, whatever he has spoken, whatever he has prophesied about you will come true. But it takes time. We don't know. For Abraham, it took 100 years for the son Isaac. For you and me, I don't know. But God says, I will do it. All my promises are, hey and amen in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what he says. Do God's will from your heart. You have to do God's will from your heart. Love God, sanctify God, serve God, walk before God, trust God, and do God's will. That's what. Do God's will from your heart. This is the most important application. Then pride will bring humility in your life. Anger will bring, what is that? Slow to anger type, or your reaction will be reduced. You will be a very nice person. All the broken spirit will be built up. It will be all made good because we are going to take the manna from the Lord or God. That is what God is saying today. Your pride will be changed into humility. And your anger will become slow to anger. You'll be a very meek person. All your broken spirit will be tied up. Bond in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, the memory verse for today, Proverbs 27, 19 says, As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects that. See, what you go to the water, it reflects your face. So one's life reflects the heart. What is in your heart comes through your mouth. When sluggish, filthy words are in your heart, it comes in your mouth. When the God's word is in your heart, it will have peace, God bless, and kind words will come. So what are you reflecting? Are you reflecting your human nature or you're reflecting the heavenly God who created and brought you into this world to bring many souls to the kingdom of God from the perishing world? God is telling to you, reflect your heart towards our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and bring many souls towards his kingdom. Many are lost, broken. Many are in anger. Many are in pride conditions. Tell them, do not boast. Have humility.
First let it come to us. And then we go preach the gospel and bring many souls. May God bless each and every individual who has come. God bless you. Peace be upon you. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless you. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.